We are uh, in the final few weeks of um, uh, the series that we've entitled The Story of God as we've been kind of looking at the historical account of how God revealed himself uh, according to the Bible throughout history and really as a way to try to understand better who he is and to dial in a little bit more on the true character of God because I think that we all have preconceived ideas about who, um, who God is and what he's like. And it comes from a lot of different places. It could be from you know, just the way that we were raised and the way that our parents talked about God or some church experience. Or it could even come from something that we've seen on TV, quite frankly, that all those things shape our view of God. And so a lot of us have a lot of different perspectives about God. You know, some of us kind of view God as like the heavenly Santa Claus, right? He's like this kind of fun grandpa up there in the sky who loves everybody and punishes no one and wants that everybody prosper material and all good gifts come from him. And, you know, the problem is that when you emphasize that, it emphasizes the love, but not the justice part that we read about in the Bible. And, you know, others of us take completely different perspective where we see God as like the heavenly policeman. You know, he's like the big fun buster in the sky looking to catch us at doing something wrong. He focuses in on the law and the rules and the do's and don'ts of of Christianity. But that ignores this whole idea that God wants us to have this Macarios life, right? The abundant life, the blessed life. And still another perspective, and I think rightly so, comes from the Bible. We get a view of this kind of angry judge, this big God who is, he's mad. And he is ticked off at sinners, and he is ready to, for anyone who crosses him, to throw them into the pits of hell. So all of us have different perspectives, but... Whatever your view, I hope that throughout this series that we've been able to understand that we can't quite really grasp God. That he's way more complicated than any of all that. So the Bible says his ways are not our ways. And we have indeed seen his frustration with Mankind, as our disobedience against God has prevailed since the beginning of time. But in direct contrast, we have seen a God who has stuck it out with us. A God who has stood at our side throughout history and maintained his presence in our lives because of his radical love for us. And so there is this tension that we find within God. The character of God. We have the God of love who wants that everybody go to heaven. And then we have the God of judgment. And we have the God who is the Elohim, the all-powerful creator of the universe, who on his command could destroy it just like that. But in direct contrast, we have the God who is the Yahweh, who loves me so personally, in fact, that he knows me by name. And he answers my prayers. And so this morning, we want to look at how all of that gets resolved. How all of that ends up at the end of the day. How will God reveal himself as we walk out of this world and into the next? What God will we find on the other side? If you were to die tonight, and you were to stand before God, on that judgment day. What God do you envision in your head would be there in front of you? Who do you think you'll encounter there on the other side as we are all standing there giving an account of our lives? You know, I'll be honest, it's a little disconcerting when you start kind of thinking about the end of the world and the end times and all of that. And and so as we begin to look at 
how the Bible says that the story of God will end, we have a very limited amount of information, but from the little that we do have, it's some pretty fascinating, mind-blowing stuff. Um, when I think about the world coming to an end, I don't think there's any picture that is more sobering than the image that Jesus describes in Matthew chapter 25, as he describes kind of a scene of Judgment Day. And it goes like this. When, when Jesus comes in his glory and all the angels with him, he will sit on his glorious throne. All the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate the people one from another, as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he'll put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. I don't know about you, but I can tell you already, I don't want to be no goat. Well, then the king will say to those on his right, all right, come you who are blessed by my father, take your inheritance. The kingdom prepared for you since, since the beginning of time, since the creation of the world. And then he will say to those on his left, depart from me, you who are cursed into the eternal fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. Now, if we were to look at this moment from God's perspective, let's skip ours for a second. I have to imagine that this is a moment that God has been dreading since the creation of the very first man in the Garden of Eden. Like when he's forming this man, he knows that there is going to come this moment when he is faced with this ridiculously tragic task of separating people one from another in order to sentence them to heaven or to hell. Now, the truth is, for most of us, this is just my perspective, that the thought of heaven doesn't really inspire us about our relationship with God because it's just so hard to imagine, right? I mean, for me, at least, the struggle is not so much, you know, does heaven exist or not? It's, am I going to be bored up there forever? Like, what are we going to be doing all that time for the rest of eternity? No Game of Thrones or... Some preachers make it sound like it's going to be this big eternal worship service, you know, so we're going to do, please stand and sing all 55 verses of when the roll is called up yonder. And then we'll go from one hymn to the next to the next, and I like singing just as much as the next guy, but holy cow. So I think that most of us, whether we know it or not, we are more motivated by our fear of hell than we are by our desire for heaven. And we don't hear that much about hell anymore because it's just really so scary, right? And it's not really politically correct to talk about. And so the hellfire and brimstone sermons of old that I grew up on in the revival meetings at my church at Central Christian Church in Harvey. They're just far and few between now. In fact, one of the most famous sermons of all time was actually um, given by a preacher named Jonathan Edwards in 1741, and it was entitled, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. Now there's a sermon for you, baby portraying God as this angry judge who is dangling people over the pits of hell as a way to get them to repent and to live right just before he sentences all the other sinners into the eternal fire once and for all. And let me tell you something. When the invitation time came, that preacher didn't have anybody coming forward to accept Jesus. Every, that whole congregation was coming forward. He scared the hell out of everybody with that stuff. But if you're like me, you do think to yourself, honestly, you go, it doesn't ring true. 
for the God that I know, that I have in my head, that this God could actually throw, I'm guessing, billions of people into the pits of hell for the rest of eternity. How, how is that? How do you reconcile that? But the real question, I think, is, is it really God's fault if that person doesn't go to heaven? Is he ultimately the one that's held responsible for that? And if that person doesn't end up getting into heaven, does it make God any less compassionate or merciful or loving as we read about in the scriptures? From my interpretation of of the Bible, God has revealed himself to not want to be a fear-based God. In other words, he doesn't want you to be in relationship with him out of a fear of hell. Rather, he wants us to be in relationship with him because we are motivated that he has loved us so much that we want to love him back. So if the Bible teaches that we have a God who is an angry judge who wants justice, it also says that we have a God of love who wants more than anything else to spend the rest of eternity with us. And if the entrance requirement to get into heaven is that we have to all lead a sinless, perfect life, and If it's also true that when the Bible says that none of us are perfect, how do you reconcile all of that? How do you bring together and resolve all of that seemingly contradictory statements that we find in the Bible? Well, I think it comes down to just one word. Grace. Let me illustrate how grace solves all all of this tension and apparent contradiction that we find in the Bible. And it's an illustration I've used since I was like a kid, but I'm a visual guy, so it really helps me to see it. So let's just say that this hand represents me, Darren Sloniger, and I am a sinner. And this Bible represents the sin in my life. Notice I brought the big Bible because it's enough sin for me. So we know that sin separates us from God. So if I'm here and God's here, this sin keeps us cut off from God. But the God of love, he loves me, the sinner, right? However, the God of justice who said, I will not let the guilty go unpunished. He hates the sin in my life. But that same God of all that resolved the issue of sin by making it possible to remove sin from our lives once and for all. How did he do that? He sent his son into the world to die on a cross, to be a sacrifice for our sin, so that whoever believes in him would not have to be sentenced to hell because he has caused the sin of us all to fall on him, leaving us what? Perfect. Sinless. So in that moment, in that day of judgment, we can stand before God sinless, not because of anything we've done, but because of what God has done for me. And so... When we talk about choices, we have a choice about this. When it's me and my sin that's keeping me separated from God, when it comes down to it, we can choose to allow this sin to keep us separated from God in this lifetime. We don't do anything to deal with it. And as long as we don't deal with it, as long as we keep this sin in our life, it will constantly keep us separated from God. And if it's keeping us separated from God in this life, it will keep us separated from God in the next. It's that clear. If we're choosing to reject God in this life and live without him, then why would it be surprised that we will be rejected by God in the next? Hell, by its very definition, is the place where God is not. 
And so if we've chosen to live without God in this life, then we have made a decision to live without God in the next. Is that God's fault? God himself does not willy-nilly send people to heaven or hell on a whim. We make that decision. We make that decision. God set up the rules and we can choose to accept the grace of God or reject it. That's our choice. That falls into our hands. You see, to me, Christianity, it levels the playing field like no other religion in the world. People criticize and say, well, it's so arrogant to think that Christianity, you know, you have to accept Jesus in order to be saved. I can't think of a more inclusive faith. We know one important thing. Heaven is the place where God will be. And if that's the case, it don't matter if I'm singing all 55 stanzas of when the roll is called up yonder, I want to be there. Revelation goes on, it says, and then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, as clear as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb, and down the middle of the great city. And on each side of the river stood the tree of life, and the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations, and no longer will there be any curse. It's a pretty obvious reference to the Garden of Eden, and I like to imagine that things will end as they began, the way that it was intended to be from the beginning, the way that God designed it to be from the very beginning until we screwed it all up. That we're now in this moment back on plan as God recreates the Garden of Eden 2.0 and calls it heaven. And now with even more beauty than anyone can ever imagine. And while we can't conceive of the kind of beauty that we will encounter there, here is the promise that we can hold on to. You will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain. For the old order of things has passed away. He who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything. You see, the story of God, it's a simple one. God loves us beyond belief. He loves us so deeply, in fact, that he gave us a choice whether or not we want to live for him and we want to love him back. And from Genesis to Revelation, God's passionate pursuit of us, of him doing everything he can to make it possible for us to choose Him, to love Him, to follow Him. Here's what I can't believe. I I, I can't believe that we have a God who loves me like that, and yet how difficult it is for me to love Him back. What a challenge it is to keep my faith fresh how I have to struggle to keep my passion and my focus alive. I don't think it's till we finally can grasp that that this life is just a blip on the screen compared to the rest of eternity that we begin to start having perspective and we begin to live differently and more meaningfully and more passionately. Because whatever it is on the other side, it'll be so much better than what we have here. And we have this promise that on that day, when we walk out of this world and into the next, and we finally have overcome all of the junk of this world, that we will have nothing to fear. Because as we are standing there 
in front of the God of the universe. We're going to be standing there like this. Sinless. Perfect. As God said, don't worry. My son got you. And you can hear him whisper. Now, come into the place that I have prepared for you since the beginning of time. I've been planning this all along. Come now into this place. And let me tell you, you're going to love it. There's no more tears. No more death. No more pain. 